Hi folks, Tino here at the Celtic Exchange and I'm delighted to be joined on today's special episode by ex-Celtic Academy coach Greg Robertson. Now Greg joins us with 18 years of experience at the Academy, working alongside coaches such as John Kennedy, Tommy Burns and Brendan Rodgers and also players such as Callum McGregor, Kieran Tierney and more recently Ben Doak and Karamoko Dembele. Greg's got a wealth of stories and experiences and I'm sure you're going to enjoy some of the detail that he's going to cover for us in today's very special podcast. Greg is now Director of Coaching at Boston Bolts over in the States, and that's where he joins us from today. So, Greg, first of all, welcome to the Celtic Exchange. How's it all going out there in Boston? Brilliant, you know, I'm delighted to, to eventually be able to, to come on the show. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a brilliant first couple of months here in Boston. Um, still trying to find our feet, um, still trying to make sure I drive on the right-hand side of the road and not the left, get in the car on the left side, not the right, um, and just trying to get used to just used to the American way of life. There's there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of things that are, that are different, just to get used to trying to get the kids settled at school, um, still finding my, my feet in the new job. Um, so everything's great. Um, we've, seen, we've seen all seasons um, in terms of the weather we arrived. We were knee-deep in snow, we got a bit of sunshine and we had good old Glasgow weather, um, drizzle and grey skies all day yesterday to make me feel a wee bit at home. So, all's good, you know, all's good. Yeah, and good to hear, mate. So, full disclosure here, folks, myself and Greg uh, actually worked together a few years ago at Celtic and known each other for quite a while now and been really keen to get him onto the show for some time. So, great to finally have him on with us here today. Greg, do you want to start off by telling us a wee bit more about your own coaching journey? So obviously 18 years at the Celtic Academy, as mentioned, but do you want to tell us a wee bit about the the route that took you there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I started coaching at a, a, a young age when when I realised that, that football um, playing was certainly never going to pay the bills. Um, I got to the dizzy heights of, of turning out for Dumbarton. Um, every so often um, down at Boghead for, for any fans old enough to remember that uh, historical ground um, and I realised that, that certainly football like all guys in, in, in Scotland football's your passion you want to be involved in the game in some capacity and I realised that, that obviously playing was opportunities were limited um, and there was a few guys involved in, in coaching around about that time I had a teammate at Dumbarton uh, at that time who's now the head of youth at Rangers, Craig Mulholland, um, and and we kind of started our coaching journeys around about the same time. We we picked up some part time community coaching work with the Scottish FA uh, and various regions, just just leading grassroots coaching sessions, uh, and and it was a great introduction. You you thought you were having twelve kids before you know it. There was forty two in a in a badminton court, and you had to manage your space and time and. And thinking your feet. So in terms of coaching, you were you you would really have to be really quite adaptive to to the situation um, around you. So I was I was keen as mustard as a as young guys are, and was picking up some coaching qualifications along the way, trying to do some voluntary work to get hours uh, under my belt. Um, worked for the for the Scottish FA for a for a number of years, and and I was fortunate enough in, in two thousand and three when a, a a vacancy arose at Celtic. When they recently set up their their community program, um, the Celtic community program, a full time position came up and I, and I applied and I was successful at the time with with my colleague Michael Halloran, who's still at Celtic now, and the two of us were appointed full time community coaches to set up and implement this grassroots program across across the whole of Scotland. Um, and that was that was two thousand and three, just the back end of two thousand and three, and then and then soon after I was. I was very, very fortunate to be to be invited into the academy by Tommy Burns um, to to assist Martin Miller, who was a huge influence in my own coaching career at Under Elevens and Youth Academy. Um, and from there, then um, eighteen years later, sees me here and coached every age group at Celtic from from the tiny tots all the way to the the full time professional players at under eighteen level one. You mentioned Tommy Burns here, Greg, and that would be as good a place as any to to get started in terms of covering some of your own early time at the academy. Do you want to tell us a wee bit more about the influence that Tommy had on you, both as a person and also as a young coach at the time? Massive. Um, and I think every day, every day you speak to who, who, who was touched by Tommy will, will say the same thing, just 
just a pleasure to be around and, and just his humanistic skills were, were incredible. Um, and, and you hear a lot of people saying it was just the way he made you feel. And I tried to carry that on to my, my coaching and just just everyday life. I think it's it's just been, and I think it's been a good Celtic person. You need to have a great level of humanity. You, you need to not take yourself incredibly serious at times, um, create the right environment for the players. Um, a lot of the players that, that maybe played under Tommy, who I maybe still keep in, in contact with and speak with, you know, they'll, they'll say that they might not recall coaching sessions that Tommy done, but they'll remember the conversations. They'll remember the little two-minute chats at the side of the pitch or at, or at lunch. Um, and those little interactions, I firmly believe, are, are massive in coaching. And, and it's a, the player-coach relationship. How you make the player feel, um, you may need to make the player feel valued. And they're all saying that the, the player doesn't care you know, how much you know until he knows how much you care. Uh, and I think that is absolutely critical, that, that the players need to know that you, that, that you genuinely have passion for them, you genuinely have their best interests. And at times it at times it creates a little bit of friction where you need to be honest and frank in terms of where they are in their development and areas they need to improve upon. But ultimately, through time, they'll come back and thank you for that honesty. Um, I think in, I've seen many coaches who will take the easy way out and tell everybody they're doing well, everybody's great. It comes to big games, team selection, end of the season, releasing players, and it becomes an absolute bolt out of the blue when you get delivered some some negative news. I think if you're always honest, um, then I think people know where they stand. So that, that was definitely something about Tommy that I picked up. He was, he was a life and soul um, all the time, always up for a joke, always up for a laugh. Um, subject knowledge of football was second to none. Um, that goes without saying. But it was just the way he engaged with people from every day at the club. You know, no matter who it was, he had time for every day, stop in the corridor, speak to the chefs, speak to the people at the front door, uh, all the way through to the directors. He, he, he treated every day exactly the same. And I like to think that's maybe something that's rubbed off on myself, just the way I carry myself in day-to-day life. Yeah, and it sounds like Tommy Burns has had a, a huge impact on you, Greg, and I know that you feel really grateful for the time that you spent with him over the years. Um, you've spoken a lot there about the human side of coaching that Tommy obviously, you know, focused quite a lot on. And it sounds like at times that's, you know, certainly you know, as important, if not more important than some of the technical aspects of coaching. And I was wondering, you've been in a number of courses, Greg, I'm sure, SFA and otherwise over the years, but do you feel sometimes that that, that human element is missing from some of the coaching courses? So, you know, it's all well and good setting up impressive drills and looking at passages of play, for example. But do you feel there's a bit of that human ele- element missing from coaching in this country at times? I think there is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think when I when I done my, my my master's degree in performance coaching, I think one of the one of the phrases that always stuck in my in my mind that, that I picked up was that, that coaching is a series of social interactions between coach and player. Um, if you've no personality, if you, you know, if your if your emotional intelligence is low, you can't read situations, you can't understand when players are down, when they need a little lift, then I think it becomes hugely difficult. And then I think the X's and O's are are irrelevant. You know, you can put on the best session in the world, um, but it's how you deliver it, and it's your your tone, your language, um, your feedback. I think the the communicational side is is absolutely critical in coaching. Um, particularly nowadays, and and just when you're saying influence of, of of Tommy, I think now, I mean you've you've certainly got some coaches still at the academy, or maybe most notably came back to the academy, Steve McManus and Arno Day, who both you know played under Tommy um, down at youth level, and, and and Stephen when when he was in first team and Tommy was first team coach. So you know you see a lot of Tommy's influence on on those guys um, and how they address the players and speak to the players. So um, I certainly think that Tommy's influence still lives strong. Out with the, the clear influence that Tommy's had on your own coaching career, Greg, you've mentioned a number of other guys at different times who I know have had big impacts on you during your own career. So guys like Brendan Rogers, John Kennedy, who I know you've got a very solid relationship with, and even Ronnie Dyler. Do you want to tell us a wee bit about your time with these guys? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, Brendan obviously brought massive success to the club and and, and changed the changed the culture and the way of working um, at the club. He, he brought in some fantastic staff with him as well. Um, Chris Davies um, as his assistant and 
and Glenn Driscoll to head up the performance um, side of the of the club. Brendan, Brendan, I, I would say again another one who was who was touched by Tommy um, and Brendan absolutely had that humanistic element to him. Um, he made people feel ten foot tall. Uh, I can recall one day uh, up at Lennox Town, I'm, I'm, I'm working away at my hot desk, and he comes strolling down the corridor, arm round Stuart Armstrong. Um, Stuart's established first team player, Scotland national team player, and he calls me over and he says, Greg, have you, have you met Stu before? And I'm saying, yeah, I've met Stu. He says, no, this is a different Stu. Stu's now scoring goals. This is this is a goal scoring Stu. And, and Stuart Armstrong was, was like a 12-year-old kid, you know, and he was so giddy and, and you know, it's just little things that, that makes even first team players, grown men, you know, with, with families, just make make them feel important. Just, just little things. So, um, Brendan had just a brilliant way about him. Um, he would often come past and I'd be working away at Lennox Town and he'd just call me into his office just randomly and stand at a tactic board for five, ten minutes. And, and it was five, ten minutes out of his day, which is probably not a great deal. But for, for somebody like me trying to progress and develop in the game and was standing in, in, in his office speaking about three box three or overlapping fullbacks, it, it absolutely meant the world to me, you know, and I went home and I'm scribbling down notes and trying to remember everything everything he said and trying to put it into practice, um, you know, for the next um, the next few sessions. So he, he had a fantastic way about him. Um, and as part of my degree, I had to do an independent study on coaching behaviours. Um, I asked Brendan if I, could, if I could use him as a subject matter because at the time there was no... There was no better access to, to a top class manager than, than Brendan at the time. So I went out and I watched um I think it was about ten or twelve of his, his coaching sessions and I had a checklist of verbal and non verbal communication which he, he offered to the players. Uh, and I just tally marked off when it was praise, it was feedback, it was tactical instruction, technical instruction, it was uh, it was very Americanized, it was scolding and hustling, etc. Um when I collated information over the 10 sessions and, and, and put the, the numbers together, the vast majority of his information was positive reinforcement, um, which is, you can imagine, you see Brendan as a very positive person. Um, but when I actually sat down and I fed that information back to Brendan, it almost that his positive reinforcement became diluted um, because he'd done it so often. Um, and, and it was just his nature to offer positivity and, and offer feedback all the time. But... Um, I, I was sitting as a, a young kind of under 16 coach at the time critiquing Brendan Rogers' coaching uh, and his, his communication skills uh, and I'm saying it's, it might be better if it's reined in a little and you offer it less um, frequently and then it becomes more valuable um, and, and it was something he was looking at me and I'm thinking I'm not sure how this is going here um, but it was something that he I think he valued uh, and took on board. So um, far from me to be telling Brendan Rodgers how to coach, is he's now managing the Premiership and uh, and I'm coaching youth players in Boston. But um, he's um, he he was just a, a brilliant way about him. very similar to to Tommy in some aspects. Um, Chris Davies was a was a fantastic one for myself personally. Um, Chris was was kind enough to give up um, some of his time to to kind of informally mentor me. Um, we'd go along and it was just informal chats. We'd get the tactic board out and we'd scribble away some things and I'd pick his brains about game plans for previous games or games coming up and, and we'd just chew the fat over football. And Chris was Chris was fantastic and he was very much um, a disciple of, of, of Brendan in the, in the nicest possible way. Um, they worked fantastically well together and you can see the... The good work that they're continually to do in at, uh, at Leicester, but um, John Kennedy, uh, I have the utmost respect for John and, and the job that that John's done at Celtic and in the, the different guises. Um, he, he initially went into scouting, um, then involved in coaching and worked his way up from from the development squad, which is now the B team, um, into first team coach, assistant manager. He had the, sh- the, the spell as intern manager towards the end of last season. Um, and you saw the in those few games, you saw the upturn in, in performance and intensity and quality within the team. Um, and John, uh, you know, I think he, the perception of John at times, when you read comments online, um, he's a defensive coach. You know, he stands at the side of training. John's, John's, um, 
very much the engine room, I, I would say, of of the the coach and John's hugely uh, instrumental in, in putting together training weeks, training training schedules for the month, the season, um, drilling it down into the days. What do the days look like for the players? What do they need? What day of the week is it in terms of lead into a game? Um, down to the the detail of the the drills within the coaching session, the individual training plans, the clips. Um, when I read and see John Kennedy, when we conceded a, a goal from a corner kick and it's John's fault, I, I have to chuckle because um, I think when you see some wonderful passages of play, the results and a goal, um, I think people should be saying that's, that's some of the handiwork of John Kennedy. So um, John is, again, another massive influence in my own coaching. I still keep in touch with John. I'll, I'll drop him a message with some best of luck for games. Um, uh, fantastic guy. Um, and maybe the last one you mentioned there, Ronnie Dyler. Yeah. Um, Ronnie was an interesting um, character and uh, afforded me a, a wonderful opportunity at the club when I was um, I was coaching maybe under 15s at the time. Um, and I had a bit of spare time during the day and a part-time um, analysis position came up within the first team. I applied for it, was successful. Uh, and for me, it was, it was about learning the... Uh, the analytical side of the game, um, working with um, with Stevie Gormel at the time, who was first team analyst, who's now moved on to Hibs, um, just to learn that whole process about how how to analyse a whole cycle of analysis within a first team environment. But for me, it was more about getting access to first team training on a daily basis. So part of my, my role was to film training and then come back in and, and edit it and cut it up and provide it to back to Ronnie Dyla, John Collins. And the other staff there, um, Stevie Woods, a goalie coach. So it gave me a good insight to to, to coach it. But, but but Ronnie was Ronnie was a guy who gave obviously Callum McGregor and Kieran Tierney um, first team opportunities. Um, so he was a, a fantastic coach, and again, great manner about him, and had good interactions with the the players. So yeah, they they guys have have came across some wonderful people and great experiences um, from people at Celtic. But there are probably a few highlights. You've mentioned there, Greg, some of the, the real poster boys for the Celtic Academy. So Callum McGregor, Kieran Tierney, James Forrest. And I know you've worked with some of these guys from, you know, when they were tiny tots, learning the, the Celtic turns and all that kind of thing, right up until their graduation to the first team. So can you tell us a wee bit more about those guys, their qualities and their progress as young footballers? Yeah, I think you. I think you look at what the academy's produced over the years. I think those ones you mentioned there are, are, are the... The real cream of the crop, I think, um, and I think that um, similarities between them all is, is um, and I'm sure they probably wouldn't debate it or, um, or fall out with me for saying it, but but they were never the they were never the stars of the team, they were never the top players. Um, they all had similar qualities in terms of they were they were very hard working, they were had great integrity, good discipline. Had a real determination, and and they all probably suffered some setbacks uh, along the way throughout their youth career, whether it not being offered a, a full time professional contract when they hit the age of sixteen. Um, I think they all developed resilience uh, at a young age, and it's probably something that maybe lacks when things become a little bit too easy for kids and, and they bounce from one age group to the next age group and um, and there's an expectancy for them to play. There's a level of entitlement. I don't think any of these lads, James, Callum, Kieran, I don't think any of them had that at all. I think they all had a point to prove. They were, uh, I would generally say they were always the hardest working kids at training. They were ones who would stay behind, pick up balls, pick up markers, help back with equipment. So they all had real humility about them. Um, and I guess reflective of their parents and the way that their parents brought them up and particularly their dads. Their dads were always the ones in and around training and they were, you know, really humble guys and at parents' nights, they, they just wanted to know that their kids were working hard um, and they just wanted honesty and they wanted a fair opportunity for their kids and they've reaped the benefits. But, um, yeah, I think those three were, were certainly real real highlights. There's there's obviously been others um, maybe who have moved away from the club. Um, I think topically Arn Hickey, who was, who was at Celtic at a, a young age, played... 13s through to under 18s um, decided his his pathway was was elsewhere went back to to Hearts obviously got an opportunity first team and now moved on to Bologna uh, and makes his debut for the the national team so 
Um, no, there's been another and an unfortunate one or two who have maybe um, seen that their, their development pathway be best placed elsewhere, um, but through the academy at a younger age, some some great talent. So there's been a number over the years, um, and, and I think the academy have, has done a great job in producing players, not only for Celtic, but but full-time professional players making a very, very good living uh, in the game. And I think that is also a, a key benchmark of the academy. Um, whilst we want to produce players for our own first team, we, we understand the difficulties of doing that. At times, you need to displace a you know a, a multi-million pound centre-forward um, or a, a, an experienced Joe Hart in goals. It, it becomes hugely difficult Um I think that the, the fruits that they can they can reap should they break into that first team are, are fantastic. And just to pick up on something you've said there, Greg, when you were discussing these young guys, but would I be right in saying that from your own lengthy experience working with young footballers in the academy, that it's often the case it's not necessarily the best player that makes it through? You know, are there various you know, traits, characteristics and skills that you need to bring to the table sometimes to make it as a young footballer at Celtic or otherwise? Absolutely, I think uh, I think their, their talent gets them in the building. You know, I think it's their attitude and personality that will keep them there and move them on to the the next level. Um, I genuinely believe it's the it's a silver medalist who, who who finishes. You know, first you know gets through the, the other ends. Um, the one that's that's maybe the top kids at youth level at 13, 14s, and whether that's it could be for many reasons early maturation. He's an early developer. You know, I've done a study in relative age effect, and I think the kids born January, February, March have a far greater opportunity to to first and foremost to be to be scouted at boys club level and and to be brought into academies. But quite often, it's your late developers, it's your late bloomers, um, who have more of a a challenge. Um, I, I, they, they develop that little bit of grit and resilience. Um, they generally have a point to prove, uh, and and they just keep developing away at a slow and steady pace. Keep developing over the years, um, and, and coaches generally want to work with this type of pe- kid. You know, they want to work with the ones who who want to stay behind and do extra, and not the one, you know, with the with the fixed mindset, for want of a better phrase. The ones who think, you know, I can do this. I, I don't need extra challenges. Um, you know, I'm the top kid right now, I've scored the most goals or I'm in the team all the time. It's the ones that want to get in the team, it's the ones that, that desperately want to get to the next level who, who develop that real hard-working, disciplined resilience uh, and a real hunger and desire to move into the next one. So, yeah, I think that uh, that aspect, um, as I'm saying, I think all these kids at Celtic at a young age are, are scouted generally on their talent, you know, what they do on the ball. Um, and I think that's something that Probably across the board, we could do a little bit better and, and maybe looking at the whole four corner model, the technical, tactical, physical, mental side of the game. You know, what do we, what we're looking to try and identify from young players at a young age? You know, is it, is it something as simple as a kid that plays with a smile on his face, loves the game, um, really enthusiastic? You know, he's got courage, got personality, 1v1s, he keeps trying to beat his man, loses the ball, keeps going again, you know, doesn't give up. Um, you know, the kids it motivates and encourages his teammates. Um, I think there's there's probably a broader skill set. I think that um, across the board we need to try and identify uh, and not just hone in on the talent. As I said, the talent will get them in, but what else do they have when they're in the building that they need to to help and aid in their development? So you mentioned there, Robo, that kids born in the first quarter of the year, so January, February, March, generally have the best chance of making it. So my own birthday is on the 18th of February. Um, so the maths aren't quite adding up for me. Can you explain to me where it all went wrong? Well, I think you've still got time on your hands, Tino. Uh, I think it's over. The dream's over for you, for you yet. I actually done a study uh, on relative age effect when I was at university, and I think the problem actually lies a little bit deeper than the, than just at the, the, the pro youth or the academy side of the game. Um, I, I managed to collate all the information from all the, the professional clubs in Scotland in terms of the, the registered players and, and the, the stats are staggering in terms of the, the kids born the first quarter. In comparison to the last quarter, there would be 4 or 5% of the whole kids registered across Scotland um, born in the last quarter. Um, so October, November, December, 5% or there or thereabouts. So, but I think it actually lies underneath that and, and probably the grassroots, the boys club um, game, where, again, you'll probably see the 
the the underdeveloped kids standing on the touchline, getting limited game time. Um, who I would put my my last shilling on them being a last quarter kid. Um, because again, I think that mentality. Um, not just of the boys club coaches, but of coaches in general, is that we need to win. It's a short termism. It's evaluating and monitoring um, performance based on the result as opposed to having other key performance indicators or other ways in which you can measure performance and not just on the scoreboard. So I actually actually would love something to come into place in terms of the grassroots game, um, fair and equal game time, um, bio-banding, where kids who are underdeveloped physically can play a, a, an age group down, um, bio-banding tournaments, 4v4 tournaments, etc. I think that we're missing out as a country. I, I think we're missing out in a, in a whole batch of kids and the size of country that we are and the number of youth players we have. I don't think we can afford to to miss out on, on any potential um, talent. Yeah, and it's clear that different players develop physically and otherwise at different times in their career and you know some mature sooner than others. Uh, Celtic obviously have a young guy on their books at this moment in time, Karamoko Dembele. And correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but I think you mentioned Karamoko to me something along the lines of 10 years ago. You were saying about this exciting kid that was in the academy and, you know, you need to get eyes on him. He's, he's such a talent. He eventually featured, I think, for Tommy McIntyre's under 20s at the age of just 13. And I'm not entirely sure if that actually helped or hindered him. Um, you know, maybe quite a lot of pressure in his, his young shoulders at the time. Um, but what we do know is that Celtic fans have now been aware of Karamoko for, for such a long time. I actually read an article this morning um, which detailed the fact that he still has less than 200 minutes of first-team action under his belt. So despite the fact that he's been at the club for such a long spell, and I know, of course, he's been unlucky with injury, but he hasn't featured all that much at all in the bigger picture. And the question at this moment in time, Greg, is you know, what are your own thoughts on Karamoko and why it's not quite happened yet for him at Celtic? And do you still think he's got a chance to, to make it here? Yeah, um, I think I probably read that same article this morning as well, Tino, um, on my phone. It was, it was a well-written article. Um, yeah. yeah, he's he's still relatively young. Uh, I think the, the next the next few months, I think, will be critical for him um, in terms of of his, his long-term future. Um, yeah, he was a kid who burst onto the scene at a young age. Um, I think my own wife I probably picked him out as being a talented kid. I don't think he needed any extraordinarily um, talent ID skill set to, to identify Kanemoko as a young age. I remember watching him play um, for Park Villa, his boys club over at Tory Glen where we had a satellite centre um, and the scout took me out. He says, I've got a kid you need to come out and see. Can you, can you come and see him? And, uh, you know, I literally saw him for 20 seconds uh, and thought, well, we absolutely need to take a, a closer look at this little kid. Um, yeah, he, he, he technically incredible. Um, left, all left foot, but right foot was, was, was is, is reasonable. Pace and power for, for such a small kid, low centre of gravity, good balance. Um, and then he, he, he just absolutely burst on the scene. And I think now with social media, he was, he, he was, there was montages of him scoring goals and going on runs and uh, it just exploded. And I think I read on that article today, he's got the second highest Instagram followers behind Joe Hart at Celtic. So, um yeah, it, it can help or hinder, I suppose, in terms of that exposure. And you're saying about having the, the exposure of playing for the, the, the reserve team at, a, at the age of, of 13 or 14. Um, I think he's, he's, been, he's been unfortunate at the, the pre-season where he, he got the, uh, a break of his ankle. Uh, he's now came back and, and I think Ange has, has afforded him minutes on, on the pitch more recently when he's, when he's came back into the first team. And it's really down to him what how he applies himself and how he works and, and I think the manager will give players opportunity. I think he's shown that. He's given he's given a number of youth players opportunity. Dane Murray at the start of the season, Ben Oak latterly, uh Karamoko will got opportunity and I think ultimately it rests on his shoulders what, what he does when he has exposure on the pitch. Um because I don't think he'll be able to come back at the end of this season and say he hasn't had an opportunity. Um, so I think he needs to make a he needs to make a massive impact um, in games. He's a player that um, he's a player. I, I, I'm, 
is one of those ones I think gets fans off their seats. And I think at Celtic, you, you need players. Um, I think you look at the DNA of a Celtic team, I think most most guys in the pub could probably, you know, play a profile Celtic positions. You know, what does full-backs look like? What does centre-backs look like? Midfielders, you know, you can trace it back to the Pomic days. Um, receiving the ball, passing the ball, box to box. And, and I think wingers, wingers need to... Wingers need to excite. They need to be on the ball. They need to be brave. You know, go back to the Aidan McGeady's. They you got fans off their seats. That noise of the of the, the the seat flicking up and hitting the back of the seat is nothing. There's nothing better. You know, when there's an excitement moment in the game and your wingers going to go and try to take on a full back. I think that's the type of kid that he is. And he comes from a bit of football and pedigree as well. He's his big brother Sirikis down at Peterborough, um, getting a bit of headlines as well, scoring some goals down there. He's been linked to a number of clubs. A little brother Hassan is in the Celtic Academy as well. Um, so there's that he comes from certainly a football and family. But um, it's, it's a it's a pivotal moment in, in his career, um, and I would genuinely love for him to to succeed and to succeed at Celtic. Um, I'd love for for him to become an established first team player and for the fans to see the. The true Karamoko, because he's a wonderful kid as well. I must say that he does a lot of things that's written and said, you know, arrogant. And I think if you're a kid and you're a you're a YouTube sensation at 13, and everybody's telling you that you're, you're the best on 14 kid in the world, you know, why would you not develop a little bit of an ego um, if that's going around? But for me, he'd always been uh, a hardworking trainer. He'd always be respectful. Uh, he, he did have a bit of humility. He, he, he had a bit of swagger at times, but again, I think in the in the right time in the right context, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think you need to absolutely back yourself, um, and he he has that confidence, um, and he's hoping in the in the weeks to come he gets a little bit more time on the grass and he can excite the fans. Yeah, and you've obviously seen some brilliance from Karamoko over the years on on numerous occasions, whether that be you know goals, dribbles, assists, or anything like that. But I do think it's fair to say that the Celtic support at large. Haven't quite seen the best of him just yet. Uh, I think from his fleeting appearances, he's got just one goal. Uh, they scored a 4 0 win at Celtic Park right at the tail end of last season against St Johnston. Just a frank question for you, Greg. Um, at his size, I think he's five foot five. Do you think that might prevent him from making it at the top level, or do you think with the right attitude, the right application, and his undoubted ability that he can make it through here at Celtic? Um. Yeah, I, I think I think he can. Um, he, he is as strong as an ox. Um, I remember joining in training with the lads at thirteens, fourteens, fifteens, and then when it got fifteens, they were just too fast and too quick for me. Uh, and Karamoko was one. He's he's turned the pace from zero to five meters is extraordinary, yeah, absolutely extraordinary. Um, and I think the way that the the first team are playing right now with wingers with the the wingers and the front three in pretty much fixed positions, um, trying to pin the opposition back four or back five, um, high up the pitch, um, and try and get the fullbacks exposed in one v one situations. Wingers running in behind off the back of the fullback. I think it will. I think it will suit Karamoko, um and trying to get him isolated with a with a fullback in one v one situations. So. Uh, yeah, I'd like to think that it would be his physicality that would prevent him from, from moving on to the next level. Um, he has pace. He's powerful for his size. Um, but his technique and his, his change of pace, I, I don't think will be an issue for him. Speaking of other young prospects at Celtic, you mentioned a young lad called Ben Doak to me some time ago now. And Ben's making headlines at the moment as it looks like he might leave Celtic to join the academy at Liverpool. Um, he's only just turned 16, so you can see why such a move might be tempting for such a young lad. But can you tell us a wee bit more about your time working with Ben and if there's anything that you feel Celtic can do to hold on to, to young talents like him? Yeah, ben was um, ben is probably a throwback to, to an old-fashioned winger. He's, he's, a, he's a righty who plays off the right. Um, I think there was a spell recently where the fad was, where the wingers played inverted, they played off the opposite side, they were playing in little pockets and um, driving in, linking with your striker. Um, whereas now Ange prefers the, the fullbacks on the favoured side in the main um, and they try and stretch the back four and play in those sides. And Ben fits that profile. Um, I can I recall when he was 13, I think, we, we, we brought him into the under-18s uh, and he made a little cameo against Hearts away, uh, and he scored 
um, off a counter attack when we were defending a corner. He, he was um, inevitably he was in the wrong position to defend the corner kick, which he probably still does. Um, picked the ball up at the edge of the box and just took off. And this little kid um, playing against a, a, a very good Hearts team who, who now have some of the players in the, in the first team squad now, and, and he terrorised them for his little twenty-minute cameo. Um, and I, I think at the time it was it was just down to numbers. We brought him along and uh, and he got an opportunity. And then he was firmly on the radar um, from there from thereafter. Um, and in terms of the where they see themselves, I think it's always going to be be difficult. The, the English Premier League has over the years has done an incredible job in their branding and marketing and globalising of the game. Um, and I think that attraction is always going to be there for the young players. That they're, they're going to see the, the the training grounds, they're going to see the stadiums, they're going to see the, all the world class players who are running about the, these first teams. And, and and it must be an attraction. You know, I think everybody deep down will will, will say that. Um, I know Ben's a, he's a massive Celtic supporter. His dreams to play, you know, for the first team. He's had a little sniff round about the first team just now. The 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 key to is, is 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 creating a pathway for these young players. I think if you can create a pathway uh, and you can articulate that to the to the player uh, and the family and they understand it and you're honest with them and as an individual plan put in place to try and help and assist them uh, in that journey, I like to think that they would take the route of the, the key and uh, and they would become established first team players. They would clock up a few hundred appearances and then if the opportunity arises, um, to move on to pastures new, the club then get, you know, properly reimbursed for their efforts uh, and time and, and in developing these players over a number of years. I, I think that's, I think that's the correct pathway. In my opinion, I think it's a win-win for everybody. Um, I think the fans see the the hard work then it's on at the the youth academy with these players coming through. We get the benefit of them in our first team. And then we get the financial gains when they move on, um, should they move on um, a lot here now. So hopefully, um, I still obviously keep in touch with going on back home. And I think there's obviously talk of, of a deal for to take to Liverpool not being finalised and, and there may be an opportunity. I know, I know that he loves um, Celtic. He, he enjoys being at Celtic and particularly now being in and about the first team. He's a young lad who's certainly be only 16 will absolutely not be phased by playing in front of 60,000 as you could see in the in the recent game against Rangers when he, he picks up the yellow card just for being a rascal. Um, that, that's, what, that's what he brings. He, he won't be bothered by, by the big uh, occasions. And, and he is generally... Maybe one of those kids I spoke about earlier on where you can watch a young kid at a young age. He gets the ball, he tries to beat his full-back, he'll lose it, he'll go again and he'll go again. And he'll be an abs- he'll be a full-back's nightmare to play against because he will be relentless, absolutely relentless. Um, and I watched him play for Scotland under-17s during the week and he, he set up the equaliser for Scotland um, with a brilliant take and through ball, and, 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 and through ball um, for the Scotland striker to finish. So... Yeah, he's grabbing a lot of headlines just now, Doak. Um, he has he has real natural raw talent, and I think within that system that the first team are playing just now, uh, and under the tutelage of of Ange, Kendo, Mick, and, uh, and Gavin, I think he would he would really kick on to another level, and I really hope to to see him uh, in the hoops for a few more appearances. Yeah, and it does sound like Ange might be willing to give Ben and some of the other youth lads more of a chance than maybe we've seen with previous regimes. I can fully understand why managers at times might be reluctant to do so, given the pressures of managing a club like Celtic and, and even things like you know chasing the 10 in a row, which I do think potentially hindered uh, some of the youth guys at the time. There's examples of young players like Barry Hepburn, Liam Morrison and Liam Hughes that we've lost recently, and maybe understandably, to clubs like Bayern Munich and, and Liverpool, for example. But you mentioned there the, the player pathway, and I do think that's something that sounds like it's been recently adopted with the young goalkeeper, Toby Oluwayemi, um, who may eventually go on to succeed current number one, Joe Hart. He's third choice at the moment, but it looks like the club have maybe spoken to him, to his family, to his representatives, and outlined a, a route that might see Toby initially become number two in you know, the relatively near future, and then if he reaches certain KPIs and, and milestones, he might eventually become our number one. And I think this sounds promising, and as a, 
a young footballer, you can see that that might be something that some of the youth guys can get on board with. I think it's human nature. Uh, that if you can see what's ahead of you and, and what may be possible, then I, I think that may be quite motivating for some of them. Do you think, Greg, historically, that some of the young kids at Celtic maybe haven't had this incentive and, and clear pathway mapped out for them? And also, do you feel maybe at times that there's been a, a bit of a disconnect between progressing through the youth academy and ultimately making it to the first team at Celtic? Yeah, I think that there may be over the, the years the number of managers I've seen um, at the club. There's there's certainly been managers who have been more invested in the in the academy and to try and create um, a link and a pathway through. Um, Brendan was Brendan was huge on the academy. He, he invested a lot of time um, in coach development sessions, presentations. Um, formal and formal um, discussions with the academy staff just to try and align um, some of the methodology and the, the coaching processes at first team and filter it through. Uh, as you can imagine, the reserve team w w would play very, very similar style to the first team under 18s. For want a, a bit of terminology or, you know, take off 10% as you go down the age groups uh, and then you get to the youngest age groups and they're just playing, they're playing with freedom and they're expressing themselves and, and ultimately I suppose that's what Celtic teams are. They're, they're, they're on the attack, they're hard working, play with intensity, defend as quickly as possible to recover possession. Um, but I think there, there, there was good synergy and there was good connection um, with Brendan um, in the first team. And, and, and you could possibly argue at that stage there wasn't maybe a great deal of academy players progressing um, and it's about pathway and they need to be better ultimately they need to be better than what's in front of them um, at the first team and some young players will get uh, offers to go elsewhere and you mentioned there um, Barry Hepburn and, and Liam Morrison um, two brilliant kids um, when Bayern Munich come calling I, I wasn't privy to any conversations or any offers that were made from um, from Bayern to, to the kids and, and what they've mapped out um, and they could have mapped out something which would have been similar to Celtic in terms of where they see them, um, short, medium, and long term um, within their clubs. Um, so I think, and I think everybody, when they're deep down, I think would would admit it's going to be very, very difficult to turn down some of these powerhouses, you know, Liverpool's, Munich's, um, of the world. And it's a short, short career. Um, but again, going back, I, I think the, the the path that that, that KT is taking. Um, and doing his time at Celtic and and getting that first team experience uh, and then getting a, a real monetary return from him. Um, but the lads, uh, Josh Adam was another one who, who left the academy, went to Manchester City. Um, so there's always going to be that. I think now with Brexit, I think a lot of the English Premier League clubs are are in and around Scotland, um, not just at Celtic, but all the clubs in Scotland and, and beginning to look at a, a younger age group um, and to, to try and plan and see who's, who's there. But I think the whole succession planning is, is critical. Um, you mentioned Toby there. I think there's, there's been a clear plan for Toby when he came to Celtic. Um, he didn't have the best of starts, but he's came and, and all credit to, to the kid. He, he absolutely has knuckled down. He's got himself in absolute fantastic shape. Um, he's putting in some top performances, which has resulted in him being called up to the first team. And the beauty of the, the the B team and the first team all training up at Lemstown is that you're you generally don't know when that call is going to come. Um, mm. And it's something we we try to always reiterate to the to the players. You you've got no idea you've got no idea when that that whistle um, is coming from the first team pitch when you need to go over and join in for an eleven v eleven game, and that might be your opportunity. And you need to be prepared every single day for that opportunity. It's not going to be. Very rarely is it perfect, that perfect progression from one age group to the next to the next. And you hit the you hit the, the maximum age to play under 18s and then you're moving on. You know, we, we were firm believers that you should never really play your maximum age group. So so we never ever wanted under 18s to be playing on our under 18 team. We we wanted our under 18 players in, in the B team. We we wanted to populate our 18s with under 17s and under 16s. And then there's a domino effect where we need to then push players up and take them out of their comfort zone. But there has to be there has to be a succession plan and all the way from first team, uh, and there has to be a joined up process um, with what they have. Look at fullbacks, how long they're contracted for, their ages, how long they you see them being at the club. 
what's at the B team in terms of right backs? Do we need to recruit? Um, is there an A team player that can move up? So I think there is a a fairly chunky piece of work that has that does go uh, on there in terms of making sure that we have the correct pipeline of players in the correct positions to go and hopefully facilitate the first team of players when uh, when and required. You mentioned something there about taking players out of their comfort zone at times and about them being mentally prepared for that call from the first team whenever it does come along. Um, but a question, how many or how much work goes into that mental performance and sports psychology side of the game with these young players? As you say, talent will get you into the Celtic Academy and you know, a number of these boys will have been the best player at their boys' club, their school, their district, or whatever it might be. But it takes something that you know that bit different to make it at the top level at Celtic. So, how much work goes into that side of the game, Greg? And is it something you've seen change during your time at the club? Yeah, I think that's I spoke earlier about the kind of four pillar um, approach to to player development: the technical, tactical, physical, and and the mental, the sports psych um, side of the game is probably something. Which I don't think a lot of clubs do particularly well. Um, I think the coach, first and foremost, has a massive um, responsibility and part to play uh, in this. And probably goes back to, to the way that Tommy. Tommy was probably a sports psychologist, but but certainly not by um, by job title. Um, and I think that those little, as as trivial as it may seem, those little interactions and making sure that you know your players. You know their family life, you know if they've got siblings, you know where they stay, what school they go to, just knowing what's going on in their life. Young players in the academy, if they've got exams coming up, are they are they stressed about exams? And I think it's important just to be aware, just to be aware of what's going around and make sure that the players are comfortable, that they can come and speak to you as the coach. If they've got any issues where they are feeling pressurised and... Uh, maybe some external factors going on which might impact the performance of training and games. Um, and again, it's that relationship between the coach and the player. If the, if, if, if the relationship's not there, the player's never going to come and tell you and expose himself a little bit and say, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit under pressure, I'm feeling I'm feeling a bit stressed. Um, I, you know, my performances might not be up to scratch. And then the coach can make a, an educated decision whether they play them at the weekend or don't play them at the weekend. Um all for the benefit of the player. Everything always needs to come back, and and we would say that quite a lot at, at, at the club. But what's what's best for the player? Every decision needs to be born out of what's best for the player. Um, the, the the academy recently has has invested in in, in a full time sports psychologist within the the, the academy. Um, Neil Addington has has came in um, and does a brilliant job. Um, uh, not just with the players, but with the staff as well. Uh, I must admit, over the last season I was at the club, uh, I had some brilliant conversations with Neil. Neil would come and he would observe training, just the mannerisms, just characteristics, feedback, um, and, and he would provide me some some thoughts uh, on my coaching process and, and, and the way I engage with the players. Um, and he would then get himself around the players and speak to the players and be a sounding board for them. So I think we always just tried to create that had a safe space when the players came onto the training field. It was it was their environment to say what they want, to to engage with staff and and to share things. So I think that um, kind of psychological safety um, is 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 critical. It's critical. Um, so I think that it is important, particularly nowadays, social media, um, where it's it's anything goes. Anything goes. Anybody can go on at any moment, faceless, and, and absolutely terrorise young football players. Mm -hmm. um, posting comments, you know, we see players, you know, signing their first contract and with a standing proudest punch with their parents with a shirt, and you read some of the comments from grown men and women, and and you, it's, it's bewildering. And these kids will read them. They'll read them, you know. And so it's a it's a difficult, and challenging. Um, environment now for, for a young player. There's so many external factors. There's agents, there's parents, there's social media. Um, there's maybe other clubs in their ear. They go away on international duty. They're sharing stories about what goes on at their club. Their club. Um, I think it's just important that make sure that our club at Celtic, we, we, we do things as, as best as we can. We, we're honest and truthful with the players, create a safe environment and just keep pushing them to, to, to maximise their potential. 
You talk about that safe space, Greg, and how it's important for footballers to ensure they can express themselves and be the best they can be at any given time. And just as a slight aside from that, uh, in terms of players and individuals, did they get anything more specific by way of maybe tips, techniques and strategies to ensure that they are prepared as best they can be mentally for a game at any given time? I um, don't know if you follow psychologists or sports psychologists such as Dan Abrahams, Steve Peters, guys like that. And I know those those guys have worked with the England football team, for example. They work on things like visualisation and you know just how to fully mentally prepare for a game. But I think we've all known guys over the years in football. You know, I know I've certainly met a lot of these guys at all levels. And you know, they're the kind of guy where if they're up the field, they're in training, they're, they're dropping the shoulder, they're, they're nutmegging guys, they're dinking the goalie and, and all that kind of stuff. But throw them in any, any sort of pressure situation or any sort of pressure match and, and that clams up or they clam up to a, a huge extent. And, I, you know, I think we've all seen that. So, you know, is there anything that players work on to ensure that that doesn't happen to them and that they're mentally as well as physically prepared as best they possibly can be? Yeah, I think I mean, there's the old phrase of, of players being training ground internationalists, you know, when you go and you watch you watch training and it's absolutely flying and the tempo is through the roof and the quality is amazing. Uh, and and you come to that game situation and, and, and there's so many external factors. We, we would just always speak about just controlling the controllables. You know, there's there's only so much that, that we that we can control about how we play. And, and generally it was always preparing our teams about us, what, what we are going to do uh, and how we are going to play and make sure the players are, are well-versed. And, and that's the importance of having a having a real detailed and robust game model um, that, that then drives your, your kind of coaching framework and coaching methodology, what you train every single day, um, tactical periodised approach to it, make sure that you're training physically the right days in the right spaces with the right number of players. The tactical element um, is relevant to the long-term approach in terms of where you want your team to be playing. Um, and it was always just about uh, about us. We never, uh, certainly when I was coaching the the teams and the players, we never got too hung up about the opposition. Um, and, and you mentioned there about big games. Um, for me, I would probably go the, the other way and I would always play down the bigger games. I think the players know it's a big game. They're... Their mums and dads will be telling them it's a big game. Their grannies will be telling them it's a big game. Every man and their dogs tell them it's a big game. So I think internally we have to. I think they know. They they know deep down. So when you play against your biggest rivals, they know it's a big game. Mm-hmm. So it's important that we just always create an environment that we need to play to our strengths. We if we do what we do, um, and and we maximise every opportunity, then. Hopefully the scoreline will take care of itself um, if we just continually focus on on the process and what we're trying to do and how we're trying to play. Um, we'd absolutely prepare them in terms of clips of the opposition. Um, I, I would I would never go massively into detail, um, and and it, the players at times can end up being fucked about the opposition. You show them clips of them, you know, building the play fantastically, scoring some great goals, and then before you know it, they. They think they're playing against Barcelona's first team. So um, I, I think it's just some visualisation of knowing, looking at set plays, you can just see the height and, uh, of the opposition, the ones that you're going to go and pick up. You can you can see how they build the play. You can maybe see how they press. That then has a slight relevance onto your your tactical preparation going into that game where you maybe tweak one or two things. You build in with a back three, a back four, how you're going to go and press. You press them with two, you press them with three. I just think those little things just put the players into the game with a little bit more comfort. Um, and they feel they feel a little bit more relaxed when they, they, they know they're more prepared going into the game. And then hopefully in most games, we're in possession more often than not. And then it's down to them. What, what do we do when we have the ball? Um so I think that the yeah the the the, the preparations is um, is huge. We, we we had a system for a while um, which monitored and evaluated the players' um, kind of mental strength um, pre and post games. They scored themselves. The coach scored them um, after a game in terms of resilience. How they dealt with mistakes during the game, um, and and it was it was more just creating some. Conversation topics. Um, if they scored themselves a two out of four, and we thought they were a, a four out of four, then there was if there was ever a two point swing in any of the the KPIs, we'd sit down and have a conversation with the player um, and, and just try and align our our thinking. Um, but the, the, I, I, I firmly believe that the the sports psych 
element of the game is is massive now um, with so many external factors um, and certainly Neil who came into the academy is doing a brilliant job with the young kids just doing general workshops in terms of um, dealing with setbacks, emotional regulation, how they can deal with with um, issues that arise in the game, giving them some strategies to, to deal with it, pulling up their socks, touching the, the Celtic badge, just something that, that uh, kind of just says to them that that moment's gone. Let's move on to the, the next bit. And he has a, has a good acronym win. What's important now? You know, the, the moment's gone. Let's address it later. If we need to address it later, let's move on to the next action in part. So, yeah, yeah there's a lot of good stuff going on. Yeah, that's good to hear. And uh, I just find that whole side of the game fascinating. And it's good to hear that Celtic are paying, you know, pretty close attention to it. There's an example you can, you can see at this moment in time of something similar with Brendan Rodgers. So he takes an approach, you can see this playing out if you watch any of Leicester's games, but he takes an approach that if he faces any sort of adversity in a game, you know, if he concedes a goal or a player gets sent off or whatever it may be, he actually does the physical action of of washing his face. So you can see him, you know, rubbing his face. Um, and it's kind of creating a mental or a physical and mental connection where he's basically saying, OK, this has happened, we accept it, and we need to move on very quickly to the next phase of play or whatever's happening. And it's just interesting to see, you know, someone at the elite level, as you mentioned, he's, he's Premier League manager, carrying out these kind of practices. Now, I think he's maybe doing it a few times too many at this moment in time for the Leicester fans liking. I think they're conceding far more goals than they'd like. But it is interesting that someone at that that top level adopts these kind of practices. Um, but overall, as I say, you know, I find it just a fascinating area. And with the, you know, the appointment of guys like Neil that you mentioned there, um, it's clear that Celtic are putting some some real focus in that area. Um, moving back to some of the first team, Greg. So as you say, ultimately, if guys are to to make it, they do need to be better than the player in front of them. That's it's just a given, and that'll always be the case in football. Um, there's young guys who maybe through necessity earlier on this season got some game time under Ange that they maybe weren't expecting. So guys like Dane Murray, uh, Owen Moffat, and Adam Montgomery, for example. And I think Murray's an interesting one. I think he's clearly a leader. He's captain of the B team and. He certainly didn't look phased when he played against Mitchelland in the, the Champions League qualifiers. Likewise, I think, you know, Owen Moffat and Adam Montgomery themselves have shown their, you know, their assets at different times. And, you know, hopefully we'll see a bit more of them moving forward. But is there anyone else, Greg, out with these lads that we should be looking forward to and hoping that can make it to the first team in the very near future? Yeah, I think those lads there are probably the ones just kind of on the periphery. Um Right now, Dane was was thrust into to first team action um, pre season and, and the European qualifiers and, and and again Dane's another one um, and, and hopefully the academy uh, as a as a main has played a part in in creating that environment um, and helping Dane be the person that he is um, and, and allowing him to be that person. He is very comfortable in the ball. He does step out. He's He's a, he's a massive lad for his for his age. Um, he strides out incredibly well with the ball. I think one thing that um, I love the centre backs and always encourage that at times when you're trying to build the play, a club like Celtic, a lot of teams will come and they'll be on a high press and they'll try and prevent you from playing out or they'll go man for man. There's a number of clubs who will just go man for man when we're trying to build the play. Uh, and I would always encourage the, the players. Even the ones in the in, in the back line, if you can outplay your opponent, it breaks the press. Um, and Dane does that fantastically well. So as soon as he can outplay, and it's it, it's risky, um, but as soon as he can outplay a centre forward or a striker and steps into midfield, it breaks the press. A midfielder then has to jump press, and then space opens up off the back of him to pick him off, and and then you get playing in between the lines. Um, so Dane, Dane does well. He defends the box well. Um, Dane, you look at Dane sometimes, and you think he. You need a little shake. You need a little bit more intensity to him. But the beauty is that that's that's what makes him him. Um, yeah. Not everybody's the same, and not everybody will play the same intensity. What Dane does play to 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 fantastic levels. He's a brilliant trainer, um, brilliant professional, um, and I think that uh, going back to the B team has given him that that regular training. I think that's important at, at the young age group that whilst going up and being in and around the first team um, training, first team squads, the young kids need to play. They need to play. It's, they're still very much on the the development continuum. 
they, they need to be training and playing on a regular basis. They, once they get out that rhythm, it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, and you go three, four weeks without a game, and then you're maybe thrust on um, out of necessity due to an injury, and you don't have that mark, that sharpness. Yeah. So, so I think taking a step back for Dane into the B team, just say he's been captain in the, the, the B team, he's a, he's a leader, um, I think has done him well. Moff uh, has been one who was... Who was um, Part of that group with with Karamoko and, and uh, Adam Montgomery, uh, uh, Aaron Hickey were all part of the the same team um, coming through the academy. Um, Moff and Monty were were two little wiry wingers um, coming through the, the the academy. Moff, you can see, he, he's excellent one v one situations. He manipulates the ball well. He's got a great range of shooting, which is something he's he's always worked on. Um, at the end of training, he'll take a bag of balls. He'll cut in off the angle and, and fire in a couple of dozen balls. Um, so to see him scoring some of the, the kind of long-range efforts he scored for the B team this season is certainly no surprise. Uh, Monty's an interesting one where Monty was was always a winger um, up until under-18s. Um, myself and, and Darn O'Day took the team um, and we just felt that for Monty to really step up to the next level, we didn't feel it was going to be uh, in the forward areas. Um, he, he manipulated the ball really well, good skill, good balance, but just he, he, he never really had the, the, the outputs, never had the numbers in terms of the goals and assists that we felt that a very, very top-level player had to possess. Um, and we had a conversation with him and we felt the way that the, the game has been played just now, that we felt having the pitch in front of him, um, stepping into the game uh, as a fullback. And particularly now, the way that the first team are playing with the, the inverted fullbacks, where they can play inside and they can jump outside. You're, as a fullback, a modern day fullback, you're all things to all men. You're, you're a traditional fullback one moment, you're a, a holding midfielder the next, um, and then you're delivering balls in the final third as a winger. Um, so it's a it's a complex position, but 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 Monty's got great football IQ, uh, understands the game really well. And his first game, I think we played him as fullback against Inverness at Lennox Town. I think he scored two from left back, um, and he was. If you see the goals and and his clips from that game, he was just rogue. He was absolutely rogue, and and we were trying to put ourselves in the position of Inverness and how you would defend against that, and and it was it, it was be impossible. Um, so you just get popping up in little pockets and receiving the ball centrally, then he'd be on the outside. Um, and he's flourished, and, and obviously um, under Ange, he got, he's got an opportunity in the first team, um, and he's got a brilliant loan for this second half of the season up to Aberdeen. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, regular first team football, um, and, and then a one that hopefully will come back and and fight Greg Taylor um, for that left back slot for for next season. I think the key is to to almost have three players for each position. You know, to have a, a your, your starter. Um, your starter, then a backup, and then a youth player, um, yeah. and create that pathway. And then to say to the youth player, you need to go and give it two guys in front of you. You know, you you, you make an opportunity uh, through default at times, but what you're going to do to displace him? Um, and it's I think that having that structure and strategy in place, I think provides that pathway to the first team. And then what are the players going to do? It's on them. Yeah, and it's interesting to hear that about Adam Montgomery from someone who's clearly spent a lot of time with him and, and can offer a genuine insight. He's clearly been on his own pathway and he's now got a, a big opportunity there at Aberdeen to impress between now and the end of the season. And hopefully he can then come back into the fold next season and, and make an impact in the first team in the left-back slot. Um, in terms of Dane Murray or, or even Stephen Welsh, who's another lad that's broke through from the academy, looking at the first team, I think we've got a couple of really good centre-halves there uh, in Cameron Carter-Vickers and Carol Starfelt. But I do feel that none of the two of them have that natural tendency to to break forward, to break the lines, to break the high press and create opportunities in the way that potentially Dane Murray can and certainly the way that Chris Iyer did. You know, he used to break into midfield, eliminate two or three guys and then, you know, make that pass to the free man. Do you think that's something that's currently missing from the first team? And do you think that a young guy like Dane Murray could step in and carry that role out? Um, yeah, I think he uh, he would be a centre back who who absolutely could step into midfield, break the lines. Um, I think the way that the first team um, I'm not privy to it, unlike everybody else, I watch them now on on 
on my laptop now from, from this side of the Atlantic. Whereas I think the centre backs are more seen as as feeders um, and building the play um, and creating a, a diamond shape around the striker. Where most teams, most teams more often than not, play with one striker, whether it's a four three three, four five one, um, and with the goalkeeper, the centre backs, the six, just trying to pick off that striker. And I think it's their jobs and their roles to feed the ones in front, the six, the inverted fullback, or through the next line um, where they can play the eights. Um, you get the inverted fullback off one side, and then the centre back can play a straight pass into the into the winger's feet. So I, I would think it'd be maybe slightly different messages now for the centre backs, where um, it's more stabilised um, behind the ball, uh, building the play, and getting the ball into the next line for the for the sixes, fullbacks, and eights uh, to go and create. Um, but I certainly think that that, that the game would be be far more than, than capable of doing that. Um, Stephen Welsh, another one you mentioned there, has, has came all the way through the academy. His team his team coming all the way through were, were hugely successful in terms of um, results, which are obviously secondary in my opinion to, to the overall development of the of the players. Uh, and a number of them have won have and, and maybe not had great careers at Celtic, but... Uh, but other clubs, Jack Aitchison down south, um, you know, there's a number of, of players, Ewan Henderson um, moving on. Grant Savory was was in around the club until recently and, and, and moved on, I think, at Peterhead now. So um, Stephen Welsh is one that's um, I, I, he's always defended the box incredibly well. Um, a lot of defenders now, when you, when you speak about defenders, you speak about the offensive side of the game. Um, for me, I think what Welsh does is he, he does his bread and butter um, stuff very well balls in the box I think he puts himself on the line um, clears danger and he's he's obviously coming through the academy he's, he's very comfortable on the ball as well he can bring the ball out and, and he can pass the ball and he's got a good range of passing um, so I think there's two you know, academy players there just behind the, the, the two regular starters at centre back hopefully are ones that I mentioned there you've got your starters you've got back up and you've got academy ones who are, who are knocking on the door and hopefully the academy ones can Leapfrog the ones in second position and hopefully then get themselves into the, into the starting spot. So there's one guy I'm really keen to ask you about, Robbo. Now, obviously you're an avid listener to the Celtic Exchange. Never miss an episode, that goes without saying. But for anyone that's new to the show, they'll learn very quickly of my belief and support of Mikey Johnson, who I think is a serious young talent and I'm just really keen to see him make it at the club. With all kind of side, it genuinely grates on me some of the, the negative stuff we see online about Mikey from, from grown adults that really should know better. Uh, this is a young guy, 22 years of age, trying to make it at his boyhood club. And I do believe that he should be supported far more than he has been at the moment. But as I say, I think he's a huge talent. And I take confidence from the fact that Ange seems to think so too. He always has him in and around the first team squad when fit and available. And he speaks very highly of him. So not sure how much you've worked with Mikey during your time at the club, Greg. But the question is, what do you think he needs to do now in terms of shaking off that tag of being you know, just another kid with huge potential? to actually taking that leap, that step, and making it as a first-team regular at Celtic? Yeah, I think I think he will get a, a fair opportunity under Ange. I think he is he's Ange's type of wingers. I think the, the, the system 4 3, three where the wingers are on the outside, they're, they're old-fashioned wingers, beat your man, um, get balls into the box, break the final line by running off the back of the, the shoulder. Mikey's fantastic with the ball at his feet. He can eliminate he can eliminate players um with a with a bit of magic. He's he's always had that coming through the academy. He can finish as well coming in off the sides. Um uh, he, he's had a, he's just had a tough he's had a tough run recently just with um with injury. Um hopefully he can he can stay injury free. He, he can he can force his way into match day squads, get some game time, uh, and hopefully force his way into starting eleven. I think the thing with the the way that they're playing is is that there's always going to be rotation within the first team um, mm-hmm. due to the intensity, uh, the way that they want to go and press from the front, the front three, controlling almost five players back four and a six or two sixes. The times they have to cover six players plus the goalkeeper. So I think that the the demands that are put on these players and then. They then need to be fresh and, and ready to go and attack when we land in possession uh, and, and break in behind, attack the box on the opposite side. Um, so I think Mikey, huge talent, one that's was um, again, he's a he's a textbook Celtic winner. Um, he's exciting, gets you off your seat, um, can beat his direct opponent. 
I remember again seeing Michael when he's his first ever outing for Celtic as a little tiny top with with the strip was too big for him uh, and he had on a pair of horrendous red boots um, and scoring half a dozen goals at seven asides and you could tell right away, you know, wonderful talent and then it was more just what else surrounds that, what's his, he, as a young kid, what's his family backgrounds, his wonderful parents, usually supportive at every game uh, as a youth player and still um, whenever I'm at Celtic Park still see the Mum and dad at the games, um, but just a good mentality as well. And I think for for winners, you you absolutely need a strong mentality. Um, you see the the Celtic fans are divided by James Forrest, um, and, and as a winger, you I think fans expect them to have golden minutes, uh, golden moments every time, mm. every time. And it's it's impossible, you know. You're at times you're going to be doubled up. Uh, against and, and, and you go at the full back and there's a six coming over to cover and you might get dispossessed and the opposition break on you but again the, the, the strong mentality are you are you prepared to go and show and get the ball again and go again um, and I think that those ones there James Forrest Michael Johnson Ben Boak they're, they're those type of they have that mentality where they'll go again um, uh, James is he just keeps popping up with massive goals doesn't he and, and still Splits the Celtic uh, fans. Massive James fan. I think what he's achieved at Celtic um, in his, his years at the club. I saw so he's turned 30 last week. <clears throat> he must be close to 20 years at Celtic. Um, that's all he's known and dedicated his whole life um, to, to the club. And an incredible, an incredible uh, achievement. I, th- I don't think it'll be until James hangs up his boots um, when we actually. You know, put out the montage of of the James Forrest goals and assists, and you sit back and you think, what a player he was. Um, I think he could potentially become the most decorated Celtic player ever in terms of medals. Hopefully, there's a few more still to come from. Um, but um, yeah, tough for being Celtic wingers. But yeah, I hope Mike. He, he's a brilliant kid, as I said, from a brilliant family, uh, and I just I really hope he gets a an opportunity. I think Ange will get him an opportunity once he's fit, um, mm-hmm. and hopefully he sees it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to paraphrase you there, Robbo. So just to confirm, you think that Mikey Johnson's the best kid to ever come through the academy and that'll absolutely do for me. Um, another young player that we can't fail to discuss here is Tony Ralston. So we've mentioned mental strength, resilience, belief and, and all these kind of things. And I think Tony's got them in spades. Um, in my eyes, he's relatively limited in terms of some of the technical aspects of his game. And I think he'd maybe admit that himself or lean towards that himself, you know, He's not a tricky winger or a, a skillful midfielder, but what he is is a, a real solid, robust, powerful defender. And I think he's just the kind of young guy who's absolutely made the most of the, the skill set he's got. And I think that's all you can ask of any young footballer or, or anyone anywhere in, in any walk of life, just, you know, absolutely making the most of, of what you have. And, you know, have you been surprised by that from Tony this season and some of the displays he's put in? Or have you seen this kind of resilience from him before? Um. I think probably being honest, I think everybody was probably surprised of where Anthony is now. Um, I think he was all but on his way out of the club. Um, He had a couple of loan spells um, and then found himself back at the the club Um, and then in the team. I think, as you said there, he is a guy who is absolutely rinsing everything he has. Um, he's, he's ones I think that the, the fans can relate to um, in terms of his effort and his energy one that absolutely loves the club um, his mum brought him to every training session every game um, along with his granddad George, brilliant people brilliant people and I think that's that is a common factor with, with those with those kids who have come all the way through the, the, the the family support they've had, um, the humility, no ego, just get about your work, just work incredibly hard. And I actually saw uh, Anthony just just a couple of weeks before we we set off for the States and he was signing his new deal with his, his little girl and his mum and his granddad. Absolutely proud as punch he was. Um, so he, he's one that, are you surprised? Yeah. Probably in terms of where he is, but 
he couldn't have wished it for a, a better kid and a better family. Um, he's doing he, he's doing fantastically well, and um, he's certainly he's not a shy kid. Um, I saw him last week saying he's he was hugely surprised about being left out of the Scotland squad, um, yeah. which I, I'm, I'm sure he's, he does have an he does have a case now. Yeah. Um, but from where he's came from to where he is now, I suppose is is testament to him, and just can't never give up. You know, you you he refused to he refused to believe his 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 dream of playing for Celtic on a regular basis was was done, and he kept going. And sometimes you need that rub of the green, a bit of good fortune, and he got it. And now, I think from coaches, managers, it's a trust. He's one that you absolutely trust. Um, yeah. Technical errors are things that you can accept, um, but understanding a tactical game plan, giving your absolute all, winning the, the free battles. You know, I've, I've very rarely seen Anthony lose a, an aerial duel you know, at, at right back. You know, I don't know why goalkeepers pick that side to clip onto. You see them overloading the right hand side of the park, thinking, what are you doing that for? You know, yeah. and, and, and Anthony just powers through and he, he, I generally can't recall him losing a, a goalkeeper kick out in, in his area of the field. So, yeah, he's brilliant. And even in the final third, playing as that inverted fullback, you're wondering, uh, you know, is he refined enough to handle the ball in there and pick it up? And, and again, testament to him, that's something he'll have been working incredibly hard on in the training pitch because as a fullback, the textbook is the centre back receives it, he opens out, he plays it to fullback, the fullback. Is generally stuck to the the shy line. You can only really play it down the line. Now it's you're tucked in as a six and you're receiving the ball. You're back to play. It's a, it's a totally different game, and he's adapted incredibly well. So yeah, he's a another brilliant product of the academy. Yeah, I think Tony's story is a, a brilliant one, and it's one that fans can really relate to in terms of that resilience he's shown. And as someone who's a, a massive fan of the club, I mean, he's been a real bonus and a, a pleasant surprise in terms of this first season under Ange Postecoglou. No one knew, Greg, what was going to happen when Ange came in, uh, and I think across his two transfer windows, he's brought in 15 players in total. So that would naturally raise a question over the opportunities that some youth players would get. But what we have seen uh, are academy guys like Dane Murray, Owen Moffat, Ben Doak getting their debuts. Others like Tony Ralston, Mikey Johnson, Stephen Welsh, given the chance to impress. Then you've got mainstays such as Callum McGregor, club captain, and obviously James Forrest. These guys are all products of the Celtic Academy. They're serious talents, and it, it just shows a huge impact and influence that the Academy's currently having on the first team. Credit for that. You know, it, it must go to Academy coaches like yourself over the years, guys like Willie McNabb that we know well, Darno Day, Steve McManus, John Kennedy. And there must be a real sense of pride, Greg, for you when you, you see some of these guys coming through. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. For, for me, that's that's the measure of success. Um, I think as, as an academy, that's our job. Our job is to try and create players who are capable of playing at the at the top, top level in Champions League games, not just to, to, to make your Celtic debut, but, you know, 100, 200, 300 games, um, as, as, as a number of them have done now. So I think it starts for us where we celebrate success uh, as an academy producing players that can then that, that can move on to the next level I think maybe that's where, where we maybe differ sometimes from from a lot of other academies who make focus on the team uh, creating a team um, we are very much uh, at times it can be well so you always need you need the team we always say that they're an individual player you need the team as a vehicle to perform. Um, you need your teammates around you. Um, that, that I'm not naive enough to, to say that the team doesn't matter, um, but the team is, the under-16s will not all move into the first team and, and play together. Um, there'll be a, a very few. You need those around you. You need the right platform. We need uh, the team functioning correctly for you to be able to do your job um, and to perform and to catch the eye of the, the ones above Um I think for us, it's it's very much individualised. It's almost an individual team sport uh, at youth level um, with, with scores. And at a club like Celtic, um, I might just be um, maybe misquoted earlier. I, I hate losing. I absolutely hate losing. I want to win every game. We Nobody at the club sets out to ever lose any game at a club like Celtic. No matter what age group you're expected to win. Uh, and, and again, I think it's it's trying to articulate that to the, to the players. You know, a club the fans expect you to win 
you know, there's a demand to to win, but there's also a demand to play a certain way and a certain style. Um, and I think now with the manager, I think that's clear. You know, he certainly absolutely will not bend on his style um, and his philosophy and the way that he wants to play. Um, other folk like Bielsa, you know, he's he would say he would sooner give up than uh, be dictated to in terms of playing a style of football that was purely driven by, you know, a singular result. Uh, fans pay good money. It's an entertainment business. They deserve to be entertained. Um, and I think we deserve, or we um, are tasked to, to try and produce a style of football which is, is fitting of that. Um, so I think, um, yeah, seeing the kids make their, can then make my first team debuts and, and then staying in the team, getting trusted by the manager to play in big games um, is real reward, really, uh, for a lot of the hard work that goes unnoticed by a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely, Greg. And, and it takes us very nicely to our very last question for today. So short question, um, simple question, but maybe not a simple answer. But what do you think we could be doing differently, Greg, or better? in this country to improve on the standard of coaching overall and ultimately improving the quality of the players coming through? Um, maybe starting top down. I think that the introduction of the, the B team into the Lowland League this year has been fantastic. Uh, I think it's given a, a, a really meaningful games programme, which was, I think, lacking. Um, a lot of the chat had been about bridging that gap between under 18s and first team football um, and historically they've the authorities have tried um, to put in different ways and means to try and bridge that reserve team um, reserve league um, a development squad league um, but really and again in only my opinion these kids were still playing against the same kids they've played against since they were under 10s at the mm -hmm. same venues um against the same teams, the same players, the same coaches. Nothing was really changing, I don't think. And, and we had to try and expose them to, to different environments. And the, the Lowland League has absolutely done that. They've they've went to play against some teams who will get the ball down uh, and play and some good surfaces. They've played against teams that will just be super direct uh, and some not-so-good pitches. Um, they've played in front of crowds. Um, so I think that that has certainly been a massive step uh, in trying to bridge that gap between youth football and first team football. I think it's given them it's given them a, a purpose um, and getting them closer to, to first team football as a league, as a table, as points. Um, because their next step is playing for three points, you know. So I think it is just just trying to prepare them um, properly for that um, for that next step. I think at youth level, um, again, there's. There's a lot of variety in terms of the style of play you play against um, against clubs. Uh, of my opinion, I feel at, at youth level we should all clubs should be trying to play an elite style of football. Um, at some of the smaller clubs, there might be a Scottish internationalist in there. There's every chance there'll be a Scottish internationalist in there. But if they don't play a style of football that's befitting of that, and to try and help and develop and aid that potential Scottish internationalist, then, then we're going to lose out on them. You know, I think at youth level, if clubs and coaches are hung up on winning a game under 15 level to the detriment of playing in an elite level style of football, then I think we're missing a big trick. Um, and whether that is all the clubs getting together, it's difficult to try and dictate how clubs play. Um mm. Uh, style of play with a national governing body get involved and in, to try and create something. Um, the Belgians had a radical approach a number of years ago when they were 64th ranked in the world and, and they've went to first ranked in the world and, and put some incredible incentives in place. Um, they play 1v1s. You just turn up. You're registered at a club, but you just turn up to an Ashworth pitch and there's a 100 1v1 pitches with mini goals set up and you just go and play because the young kids at a young age don't want to pass the ball. They just want the ball um, and and they learn the, the social dynamics of the game later on. So they play 1v1s and then they move into 4v4s 
um, the Belgians with a diamonds, and then they go eight v eights with a double diamonds, and then they go eleven v eleven, four three three. So they're just continually adding layers on, um, and they have a real clear process. Um, they also have shadow squads or future squads for kids who are maybe that fourth quarter kid who might not physically be ready to play in a national team, but they play for the futures and and players who played for the Belgium future squads, the likes of De Bruyne, Dries Mertens, who might be missed um, in, in previous regimes if you're only picking players based on the here and now. So I think that these processes were put in place to try and widen the net uh, and to try and safeguard for kids who are maybe technically very good, tactically astute, but maybe physically just a little bit behind uh, and to try and keep them involved and keep them in the system if you feel there's other uh, aspects that they do bring. So I think um, I think that the, the governing body could possibly look at, at um, the best practice without trying to replicate because we, we are who we are. Uh, and again, you need to look at the DNA of Scottish people. You know, what's our strengths? Hardworking, honest, integrity, disciplined, um, and play to our strengths. But I think there's um, maybe a, a, a requirement just to look at grassroots football, youth level football, and, and look at the structure and what we're doing and how can it, how can it be more beneficial to the overall development of of the young players. Um, I also think that um, I think we do miss a lot of talented young kids in Scotland, um, purely because of the pay to play boys club model. Um, I understand the economics of it. You need to keep the you need to keep the wheels spinning. So you've got uh, astronomical pitch hire. For, for uh, Astra Tough pitches, you've got league fees to pay, you've got referees fees to pay, you've got kits to pay for, etc., etc. Um, and you need to bring money into the club, um, and all these clubs don't make a, a penny from it. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, underprivileged families, um, particularly in Glasgow uh, in the west of Scotland, who, who can't afford to pay the thirty, forty pound a month um, mm. boys' club fees. And basically, that's, that's ultimately where all of the, the youth academy co- uh, scouts will scout across the boys' club game. Um, because unfortunately, there's no there's no school football anymore because school teachers don't want to give up time. Janitors don't give up time for whatever reasons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Things, you know, moved on. I understand that. Not living in the past. But I think there's a gap of kids at school football. I think if I was involved in... Scottish football at a club in terms of recruitment, I would definitely look um, at schools football and trying to engage with schools and, and find kids who are maybe not at boys club football, um, maybe just purely for financial reasons. And I think there's going to be a heck of a lot of talented kids out there who could who could come into the professional youth academy system uh, as a result. Yeah, a brilliant response there to, to a pretty tough question, Greg, and I think it's a, a good a place as any to round off what's been a really interesting discussion overall. Um, I think today's been a fascinating insight into some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes at Lennox Town and, and possibly in Scottish football more generally, as well as giving us a bit more of an idea of, of what it takes for young players to make it to the top at a, a club like Celtic. I do think as part of that, we've probably covered just about every kid that's ever come through the, the academy. But again, really appreciate your time giving us some of the, the brilliant and detailed responses there. So I think all that's left, Greg, is for me to sincerely thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, hopefully some of the, the listeners can see just why I've been so keen to get you on the show. Some brilliant stuff there and, and hopefully something for everybody. But again, thanks for your time, Robo. Best of luck to you and the family out there in Boston. And I'll speak to you again very soon. Appreciate that, Timo. Thank you.